I think that cinema, at least for the next few decades, still will still be dominated by the English speaking world. Uh, although Probably. obviously Holly, uh, Bollywood in, term, is, in terms of money making I completely agree mm-hmm. it probably will I watch a lot of films from Korea yeah. they're fantastic the discipline they have over there for making so- but these other people the, the money making is in the west mm-hmm. if these people want their film to make money they have to do so well as to get their film over to the west and to do that they have to make a crack in film so yeah they have to they have to make the effort whereas in in hollywood if it's already backed by hollywood they're going to make their money mm. back because they've got great marketing and this is um this is something that a lot of indie people have uh struggle with as well is they don't have guaranteed distribution if you don't have guaranteed distribution your film is worthless it's yes. not going to make much money mm. you're just going to put it on YouTube and people are, are put on one of these websites where oh you have to charge like 150 to unlock the stream they're not going to make much money mm. no matter how many producers you have attached to it if, if you don't have the distribution yeah you've got nothing exactly distribution is one of those things and it's it's for one thing just because just you touched on Korean film I'm not, you know, I'm not a big. For example, I'm not into anime and stuff like that. I don't know mm. much about that kind of stuff. But it's that's esoteric as fuck anime. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a bit you know, pervy as well. Yeah, I don't know if you've yeah. noticed. That. I mean, it's not even not even the hentai stuff. Just the regular non-porn stuff is kind of porny. It's weird. Yeah. Um, but it's it's very odd where you're looking at it. And it goes, is this supposed to mean something? It's like watching an entire show that's the last twenty minute sequence of uh of twenty uh two thousand one space Odyssey. Yeah. The whole thing is just like weird <laughs> negative shots of like over over like a terrain moving terrain you know but uh it's uh it might as well be anyway but in terms of um korean c- uh, cinema what did you think of snowpiercer snowpiercer i haven't seen mm. i know the people involved in not personally mm. involved in snowpiercer and i'm familiar with their previous work and their previous work is fantastic uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Snowpiercer is the train that travels all the way around the yes. world. Um, yes. After was it nuclear design uh, they, or something? They, they had tried to reduce global warming by putting the equivalent of antifreeze in the atmosphere. This is kind of a blurb for those of you listening. I don't want to give anything away. And have accidentally triggered an ice age on the planet. So this train and has it, to move around to keep it warm. And there is basically a microcosm of of a class system inside the train. The people yeah. at the front are rich. The people at the back are poor as shit and are being fed um, recycled beetle guts. It's it's quite weird, but it's the guy uh, Chris. What's his name from from Captain America? Um, which I thought that by the way, the Captain America: The First Avenger was actually a reasonable film. Have you seen Winter Soldier? I have. Yeah, uh, I Everyone heard it says takes a far more political approach to Winter Soldier. Way more political drama yeah. with superheroes. Yeah, Winter Soldier is basically about the uh, you know the American drone campaigns in Yemen and places like that, and, and it's about government control but the first one is 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 a sci-fi world war ii film yeah which i thought was great you know this idea where you've got this um this this kind of this secretive organization of nazis who are trying to get the tesseract and stuff it's a very strong film everyone though i i talk to says the winter soldier is better I'm like, i don't think it is i think uh, marvel have this problem seen- where they're like we have these big sky ships that blow things up but what in the sequel we're just going to have more of them you know it's the michael bay approach it's just bigger make it bigger it's like i think that's cheap i think that's too easy Especially with special effects and sci-fi, but yeah, Korean film—that's another industry. That South Korea, obviously, yeah. North Korea <laughs> industry is basically non-existent. But apparently, in the fifties, they bought a, built a whole replica. You know who Shane Smith is, the guy that runs Vice. Yes, he said that in the fifties they built a massive replica of Twentieth Century Fox in North Korea. Got all the same equipment, and they started to kidnap Japanese and South Korean um, filmmakers and bring them to North Korea and make them make propaganda films for the regime. Uh, oh, now I've I've seen the documentary on Team America and they briefly talk about Kim Jong Il, uh, not only making them do that but teaching Kim Jong Il himself how to make yeah how to direct films. He he wrote he wrote several books on filmmaking. He did. Yeah, I think I sent you one of them on, on Facebook. There you go, man. You'll, you'll need this. You'll you'll need this if you want to be a star. Jesus, uh, Doug, you're going to need Kim Jong Un's uh, tips on how to make great films. You know, it's surprising. I've read very little about filmmaking. It's all been practical yes. growth. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a couple of books by Lloyd Kaufman mm-hmm. where he talks about how to sell your. Which this is good. He, uh, if I was to briefly educate you on Lloyd Kaufman, he he runs uh, Troma Entertainment, which is the uh, kind of splatterhouse 
uh, horror genre over in America. They made things such as The Toxic Avenger or Tromeo and Juliet, etc., etc. Very exploitive. But he's done it independently for so many years, like several decades, so he's a good person to learn from because he's making glorified crap, but he's still doing it. He's still able to do it, so he's a good guy to take advice from. He himself knows he's not, he's not so talented, but he still has had a consistent career for 30 years. Yeah. So if a talented person can take that kind of information, yeah. they could maybe... Well, I mean, George, a George A. Romero's been making the same film for the last 30 years. It's great. Zombies! <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I mean, I you know, from some of them, not so great. Others, I mean, I think the most original zombie film that's come out in the last 15 years has been probably 28 days later, but... If, um, if it, there's, it there's the, the controversial of, of whether or not it's actually zombie related, yeah. it's a yeah. it's a virus. Um, I'd I'd put something like um, uh, Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead is a comedy film, but yeah, Ross once film. again, like why the fuck are you talking yeah. about Shaun of the well, Dead? I thought but. I thought I do think that Hot Fuzz is is a better film than Shaun of the Dead. Yes, well, Shaun, they're, they're both great, but I, I think Hot different. Fuzz is, yeah, Hot Fuzz, the inside jokes go to the nth degree. They're like insane. You know when they've got like Aaron A. Arneson, who's in the phone book, but then they've got Stephen Merchant like playing Aaron A. And it's ridiculous. They're like, it's this infinite dimensions of inside well, jokes S- that they Stephen have. Stephen Merchant film. was a P.I. Staker, Mr. He was, Piss no, he Taker. Was, he, yeah, he was yeah. Mr. Pete, Peter Ian Staker. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, no. Who was Aaron A. Arneson? He's a little kid. And you see him like in the third act of the film. You go, oh yeah, that joke from the start of the film. It's got there's it's layered. It was made that way. As ben Stiller used to say. In, I'd, in I'd quite like to. Mm. Extras was a great show for like, that introspective. I didn't idea. watch Extras but, yet, believe it or not. It's, it's a shame. I'm a big it's fan good. of Ricky Gervais and it's very, Carl. It's awkward humor. It's just yeah, painfully much like awkward office, humor. The yeah. Office was. It's, um, but yeah, that for the where you actually like hide your face because it's like you know they've got skin a scene, crawling. Yeah, yeah, they've got an accidental racism scene with uh, Samuel L. Jackson, and you're just like, oh. I don't well, see then this. they had the accidental dwarf scene with yeah. Warren Davis. Then they oh. had the oh, he accidentally insulted somebody that had Down syndrome yeah. at the table and has oh, to be terrible. Palsy, wasn't Cerebral it? Yeah, palsy yeah. or something. And, and yeah, there, yeah and, it, and he, he links it to the Holocaust because they're doing like a Nazi movie. <laughs> and yeah, when he, when he accidentally knees Warwick Davis in the head, you feel like it's real like paparazzi journalism footage almost in a way, even though it doesn't look like that. You go, I wasn't supposed to see that. This was horrible. It looks so authentic, like something that would actually happen, you know? I mean, so so take... um Take uh, with with regard to uh, with regard to open lines. Mm. With open lines, that aside from being the longest thing you had ever made, and you did say the last time you were on the show that the, technically the longest thing you were ever making was stuff with a CCTV camera, right? No, no, no. This is even longer. Open lines was even longer was than, CCTV than the CCTV camera, camera. Yeah. Uh, and that was an interesting story. Was that just one that your dad just owned? Yeah, I. I Take take yourself back to early two thousands. Getting a video camera wasn't that easy, and if no. you did, you had to record it on tape, which made editing almost non-existent. Yeah. Uh, in the average, it was house. just what you had. Yeah, I mean, the commercial ones for regular people were really just so you could film the holiday. We no. uh, yeah, basically that's what. And that was the quality people. of the films that me and uh, Peter mm. uh, Peter Christie, who now is oh what a what a coincidence. He's also in Korea right now, uh, south of course. Um, yeah, teaching English. Um, we had to take a VHS tape, put it inside the TV, record, stop, mm-hmm. and then record for the next shot. What makes this difficult is when you're recording on a videotape, you've got about a two or three second delay before it starts recording. Right. So you'd have to go back, pause it when you wanted the cut to take place then go back three seconds and time it so that you were editing oh, the footage Christ, together yeah. and then um, oh I've got to get hold of some of those tapes mm. and uh, transfer them to DVD yeah. so I can show people they're yeah, bloody there's something awful. wonderfully manual about that though in a way yeah know? well we became almost experts on it yeah and at, at a young age learning about uh, linear non-linear edit and mm. you had no idea how useful that would be when you yeah. when you go on to making things digitally mm. the ease Mm-hmm. The ease were spoiled, absolutely spoiled. Yeah, it's insane. I mean, and 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 even they are telling us here in in my course, they're like, uh, you know, in five years, 1080p is going to be getting laughed at. You know, like it's already 2K, yeah, 4K, they're so, taking yeah, over. I'm nuts. still filming on 1080p, exactly. and I worry about and it's it. It's a big problem with streaming as well because most computers still cannot stream from YouTube at 4K. 
even though you can upload to YouTube at 4K. Um, Most editing software, yeah. your computer I mean, can't handle that laptop 1080p. Up and blow it through the fucking ceiling. Oh, it's, probably. So, so, so open lines, you see me focusing it now. It's crazy. Oh, uh, wow. Open lines. It's almost like I've had the ability to do it the whole time. I'm just a digressionist. Um, and it's and it's it's something that I, to some extent, I can't help. But I have to constantly guard myself subconsciously <laughs> against it. Like, stay on topic. Sorry, so, what was that like about I'm the firing octopus? the proton <laughs> torpedoes into the center of the Death Star? I was just stay on target. Stay on target, you know. Uh, but it's um, those are proton torpedoes, aren't they? Uh, on the X-wing, uh, New Hope. Um, I just call them lasers. I didn't like Star Wars. No, the original. we're digressing again. Yes, we did. Yes, sorry. Um, so, Open Lines was the longest thing that you had made technically. Then and was, easily was, the the hardest yes. effort. What was it? They say an hour and a minute, right? So for post production for you, from the time you finished filming to the time you released it, how long was that period? Five months. Five months. Yeah, and it's a, and how much Ten did you shoot? Also, yeah. How much did you shoot? Not that you took sep- You know, a second. You mean take. if it wasn't edited, how much footage would yeah, I? Yeah. How much did you have? But also, how much did you have that you eventually decided to cut out? You know. Oh, there, there's a question. Mm. Um, there was probably only one scene that was about a minute and a half that we cut. Yeah, or you and it wasn't. Necessary. Think you'll ever upload that? A deleted scene from no. Open Lines. So how how many how many hours do you reckon, or maybe how, how many minutes of, of footage did you did you actually film? Uh, three hours and uh, forty eight minutes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So there was a lot to there was a lot, lot to of sift through. A lot. Th- this took up. This was God. It was hundreds upon hundreds of gigabytes. I I leveled my computer down to like um four megabytes was left, and I had to start going away and. Uh, I bought an external hard drive and I had to shift everything over because I couldn't continue making the film. Yes. I mean, did you shift the film footage over to the external hard drive? Yes. That's the problem because you're, if you're editing from a USB, the it's transfer speed is... Slower. It's, it's yeah. horrific. It's, it's, um, for example, USB 2, I think it's top like five megabytes, something like that per second. And it's usually, it usually what happens with USB is it starts fast and then it ends slow. Yeah, yeah, USB transfer speeds actually decrease the longer that you're transferring them. It's a strange effect of that kind of technology. I, I can promise I will never do it like that mm-hmm. again. It yeah. was an absolute nightmare. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Fire, FireWire, I think that's a FireWire port there. I've never probably used FireWire. No. It's, it's, uh, FireWire, w- what will happen is it will start slow, and then it will reach a constant and continuous yeah. speed, and it doesn't decrease. USB starts fast and then decreases, but then will they'll, they'll stop. It will plateau, and that's the problem when you're editing off uh, of the actual computer's hard drive itself, the internal hard drive that's usually hooked into the SATA ports. It, the transfer speed is a lot faster. The only other way you could have done it, aside from the people that have editing rigs, you know, they have a separate rig mm. for editing, specifically for editing, is if you had transferred all the stuff on your computer onto the external hard drive instead of the other oh, way around. God. <laughs> Can you imagine that? You know, it still yeah. would it still would have ate up. Yeah. I yeah. mean, my, my computer only holds, I think, um, 200 gigabytes, and I was yeah. pushing three. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it was not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was, a, it was a long, long effort, and I was just doing this all myself. Yes. Just, just me, every sound effect, every shot. I was the camera operator. I was the writer. I was the producer. Mm-hmm. I built the set, which mm-hmm. uh, you saw the radio station. Yeah. It's, uh, that's I just thought a it bunch was of amazing, old... that radio station. For example, <clears throat> so I said uh, post-production, you said about five months. Yeah. Um, and you're no, re- no, no. Pre-production, filming, and post-production was about a five-month period. Right, I, okay. I think we, we started in April 2014. Right. April, May, June, July, August, September, October. <laughs> nearly seven mm-hmm. months. Well, how, so how long would you say it took you to actually take this from an idea, a notion in your head to a reality? And not in the sense that you were filming and it was finished, but in the sense that you were, you were ready to film. So that period of pre-production, how this long was, was that? This was the problem. I finished the script two days before we... Right, okay. Sorry, I started the script three days before we started filming and I finished the script two days before we started filming. So you, re- you did it in a day, essentially. Yeah, and yeah. The, the script was also 10 pages long mm-hmm. and the only thing that was written, only one, was the radio station scenes. Yeah. This whole film was supposed to take place from the point of view of the radio station. Right. The audience was supposed to be left with a mm. sense of ambiguity. Yeah. We are seeing it just from Des's point well, of view. Well, yeah, that's a gardening uh, uh, solution as opposed to an architecture solution, which means I was talking to my friend Ruben, who makes music. I was talking about this this time last year. 
um, he was on the show and his, his kind of stage name I suppose is Deadlock and we were talking about music he makes electro music and I said are you a gardener and ironically he was he had a track um, that was actually uh, had a music video it was directed by, by my friend Adam Boris who do you know Adam? You I know, know Adam Boris you're, you're thinking that the BAFTA nominated I'm a gardener Yes. yes. Yes, I know Adam Boris. Yes, I, Adam, Adam Boris. Adam Boris contacted me and I was really? surprised that's awesome. because he's a fan of Open Lines. <laughs> really? Is he he was like, it? I saw that's Open great. Lines and I'd really like to work with you and I thought, dude, you got nominated for a BAFTA. What the oh, fuck do you want to work with Adam, me for? Adam, Adam is... Um, <laughs> Adam, I, I, the way I, I view you and Adam in my head and I do kind of view you side by side in a way because Adam makes films in a different way from you Uh but his films are all short films. Yeah. I've often thought, what would happen if those two guys combined those, you know, because it's it's a, it's a crazy idea to play around with. And definitely, man, at some point this year, I want to have you and Adam on the show. Both at the same time. Both Adam, at the same right. time. I have three microphones. That's the reason I have three microphones, because three's a crowd, yeah. you know, and you bounce off. And, and, it, and it cuts down my digressions. That's, that's it the, does. The we'll talk secret. over you. And the, and the reason, actually, the last time I did this, I was uh, had someone else on the show. I mean, I was... I was um, coming straight from just having a bunch of other people on the show over the summer and it's for, with me it's when you get back into the motions I digress less so if you listen to the last one I did which is about the referendum I didn't digress nearly as much it was more focused You're I haven't done this yourself, since September huh? yeah I was, <laughs> I was saying so. well most of the time I do talk to myself which might be the problem uh, but I have a big full list of people that I want to have on this year yeah I've noticed you wanted Dezo Gorman yes uh, uh, Huchim, Dezo Gorman. Oh, the, I'm sure the stories he could tell you about open lines would be horrific I put yes. him through hell yes he was uh, the radio station was built in an attic. Uh, Blind Poet, Blind Poet Edinburgh, was where it was filmed. It was where it was filmed. They've got a loft, and in the loft we built the radio station just with a table. Uh, I brought my PC along plus a spare monitor, and we just put loads of old DVD players, VCRs, scattered some CDs around a couple of uh, fancy lights, and the only thing that we bought for the film was the microphone that he's speaking into. Yeah, which was just a prop yeah uh, we Do thought, you still, have you kept it though yes I, yes I gave it to my cousin who uses it for gaming right okay um, right so, so so it's 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 creating endless hour, endless uh, hours of Minecraft footage right now it's oh helping to, god it's uh, helping to he create he does play it I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be surprised three dimensionalized Minecraft for an audience of millions he also has a YouTube channel where he does uh, play alongs with yeah. games yeah. Uh, he's not quite as popular as PewDiePie but he'll get there mm. um, so the but th this this was a place with no windows mm. or any they had one window which we had to close for soundproofing reasons yes. uh, no air conditioning and we had three 750 watt lights on days and we filmed all in one sitting we did all the radio station scenes so I was surprised that it took us as long to make the film as it actually yeah, yeah. did so he was sweating and at the end of the shoot he almost passed out mm. it was it was really hard on him and it d didn't get much easier because he, he got kicked in the chest by my cousin and uh, oh yeah of course yeah he got kicked but yeah. he actually got kicked in the chest uh -huh. <laughs> Ozzy your, is not your an actor cousin, so he doesn't yeah. really pull his punches so he just kicked him right yeah. in the chest I mean it did, it definitely looked um, uh, realistic and, yeah and, and, uh, and um, it's, he was also suffering from a migraine at the time which didn't really? help uh, wow. Des Christ talking about but, suffering for your art but, right? but what I'm saying there is every scene that wasn't the radio station scenes mm. wasn't written and we were calling it as we were there mm. this is it, it's been praised because people yeah. have said oh that's quite a well flown film it's yeah. like that's what I mean it? it's a gardening it's, it grew organically as opposed yeah. to being architecture which is set down in stone and is a thing you, and it was you started with a radio station and it blossomed into this larger yeah and you know the blossoming was a mistake as well because the only reason I added scenes of the driver going around doing his thing during the day uh, during the night was because filming as quickly as you do with Des on that day you're going to get some continuity errors whereas you don't have a shot to cut to so you'd have to cut to the same shot which is looks like a jump cut so I thought alright I'll put in a scene of the guy driving around to to tie them together yeah. tie those two uh, shots together then I thought if I'm shown that I may as well show him do more mm. or if I'm showing him do more then I may as well show him kill the prostitute oh spoiler alert oh if I'm going to show him killing the prostitute I may as well show the prostitute going about her day for a couple of scenes so that you can gain a bit of sympathy from her. So what started off is just, oh, we're going to film it in the radio mm. station, unintentionally, accidentally yeah. turned into a story that followed three different characters. Mm. 
So I mean, that's that. I love that. I love the fact that it, it kind of grew organically in that respect. I think it's, it was great. I was I was I, uh, seriously impressed by. Thank by, you. By Thank you very much. I, I, I genuinely. I'm not just saying that because you're here. Oh, <laughs> just, sure. You're just saying, um, you know, it, it, it cuts to like Adam Bors. I was seriously impressed, Adam. By uh, no, no, I, it was great, and I did not know. I think until I got there for the premiere, and you had the premiere at um at. at at the Banshee Labyrinth yeah. in Edinburgh, which is a great filled, place. filled venue oh. and personal as well. Mm. It, you, you could see every member of the audience, and they were all people that you know. It was yeah. a very personal environment. It reminded me actually of, of something I'd read, and we mentioned the Warriors earlier. Yeah, that people were sitting on the steps of not on the seats themselves because there wasn't space uh, in this tiny theater when the Warriors first opened in '79. It was such a small film at the mm. time. And um, that was similar to your premiere as well because because people couldn't fit; they were standing up at the door. Well, I was standing; I was as far back to the door as you could yeah. get, and I was having to turn away people from the door. Yeah, strangers; they just wanted to know what was going on. But I said, "You can't fit in." Yeah, this is too many people, and I had to go up and speak to all these yeah. people. And I, I'm not a public speaker. And the more I'm, people that were in the room, the more excited Ross became. He was yes. insanely excited, <laughs> especially when he was on screen. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. Ross accidentally in the film as well. I couldn't get hold of the actor that was initially supposed to play the part, so I got Ross. He had the fake yeah. teeth and everything, and surprisingly non-comedic. Role yeah, from Ross. It, it was quite. It was like his. Um, what was that Jim Carrey movie that where he was where he played like quite a straight character, and it was very odd. It was like a horror film, the number, number 13. thirteen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or and then, but the opposite of that as well is uh, Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder. Which is the yes. kind of character you just don't ever assume that Tom... He's never played a character like that since, I don't think. Well, there's a one-hour poster, a uh, one-hour photo poster on the wall there, and as well, Robin Williams, comedian, mm-hmm. occasionally went out of his comfort zone and played, like, a child killer. It was just mm. crazy to see that. Yeah, it's it's always very... Um, it, it's kind of uncomfortable, because uh, you feel like a fish out of water when you see an actor that you're almost accustomed to them being a certain way. But you then know, when, the when they are that certain way, man. you're fucking sick of that actor always playing the same part, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it's it's very strange. It's... um. Yeah, it it was it was I loved I loved open lines because of the scope of it, which I'm very interested to hear that the scope was actually much narrower to yeah, begin with. Yeah. And ten minute long film it was yeah. supposed to be. And the cinematography I thought was very interesting as well because there was a lot of blues that I find like but there was a great contrast between the radio studio that, that had this very kind of uh this very kind of um th- it was almost that it it added to the detached nature because blue is a colour like I associate in some weird like Freudian way with like you know Sex with your mother. Well yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well everything that that's Freudian is somehow to be associated with sex with your mother, you know. It's, it's it all ties into like incest. Well, I can tell you about the color palette there. Um, yeah. You'll notice from the the first half of the film, it's mostly filmed from one side of the desert where the light that's on him is blue. Yes. So yeah, and the blue uh, light is like detached because he's out of the situation directly. He's just talking to these people over the phone, so it's almost like yes, yeah. this detached unit. The blue adds to that. Then when the film and this was very much intentional when um when things started getting sinister and deeper, he turns his head and the. I, see, I shoot from the other side of his face where it's a red light red so light, it has a, a more sinister look yeah, on, the, more, yeah. on the character so that was a deliberate thing that was very deliberate that, that's, that's very awesome. deliberate yeah. Um, yeah. then when it went outside we couldn't afford lighting yeah so everything's just how it should be it's mm-hmm. just gritty mm-hmm. real because that's what it is there's no light yeah. and no cinematography just the camera doing its work so it's capturing a more realistic um, yeah I mean, Look. It, and how much did you have to improvise with equipment? Because I mean, I, 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 lights are expensive. Do you own lights? Yourself? I own lights. Right. I own lights. The only thing I had to buy for the lights was a blue and red gel, right. so that yeah. I could change the colours. Mm. That yeah. was it. And you have two lights, I guess. Three, three. Yeah. Three. yeah. So you got a lighting kit of like three lights. Yeah. yeah. Three, three and, lights. and they're they're very pricey. They cost about twelve hundred. Yeah. yeah. And for you, I mean, I ask you this question maybe now. I don't know how many you have off the top of your head, but uh, for other people who are who are perhaps less experienced than you, um, having not made a full 40 minute film yet and two separate films before that and and even experimented with smaller stuff like like uh, like the blood donor advert for example oh. uh which we won't <laughs> go into um what do you have any do you have any tips or advice in terms of uh, improvising on the spot that, that you found that when you were making particularly open lines that, 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 that you would have liked to have known about before then but that you ended up improvising on the spot and using um, and being quite surprised and pleased with the results as a result you know. because of how time consuming it is I'd say if you're able we were filming in such a tight space we were able to set up the lights 
so that when we first set them up they were fine for every single shot we used we didn't move those lights yeah. after they were set up for the first shot which is lucky we were very lucky to get away with that it saves you so much time and it means that you don't have the continuity errors between I'd say try and light for as many shots as possible yeah. with the one set up it saves you so much time oh my god I, I can't I can't even I can't even tell you I mean a 10 hour shoot if we had to alter the lights between every one uh, it wouldn't have been possible and it was I, I, I could be getting this confused with something else it was shot on two cameras no on one camera one camera do you know what I'm thinking of with, with two cameras I'm thinking of uh, a fringe survival guide that that was two, two cameras, cameras. Yes, Ross because Ross, Ross had his own camera one. and then you also yep. used your camera so the whole thing was shot on that camera was that the same camera that we used when, the last time you were on the, the show the exact same the one, exact yeah. same one with the 12 minute still uh, use it to this day yeah and I suppose the 12 minutes thing is not a problem with shooting a film but we had a constant camera on us and I remember every 12 minutes it would turn off yeah because it was 25 frames oh, a second um, which uh, um, you'll notice uh, it was a problem for open lines you might have noticed a lot it was hard for Des I didn't cut an awful lot mm. when Des was talking sometimes there'd be long two minute long mm. stretches where it's just him talking and the camera's moving because mm -hmm. I didn't want to distract the audience by cutting away and I yeah. like the long drawn out shots I take a lot from European great cinema great acting you like Des, you like Des an actor good, oh, God. good. It, was, it was very it was you know a uh, very much a comedian out of his comfort zone as yeah. well he's a, he's a yeah. comedy actor he played, I was, played it very straight and yes yeah. uh, and, and then, first of course mm -hmm. he's, he's a bit cheeky and a bit, a bit witty but he's a radio DJ that's what they yeah. were, he was supposed to do so that element of Des's character in reality complimented his character yes but he's got such a such a face for camera. The yes. camera loves his face. Exactly. And, and bear in mind, the last time I had actually seen Des prior to watching the film at the premiere... Was in a bar was, getting drunk or something? Well, 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 the last time, he may have been there afterwards, but I dropped by on the way back from work, I think. Uh, no, no, I dropped by on the way back from my mate's house to go and see his Ghostbusters show during the festival. Did you see his Ghostbusters yeah, show? Yeah, it was great. It was great. And then Ross was there as his... As, as, as his um, compare. As, compare, yeah. And and I missed Ro I, I saw Ross's show at the beginning of the festival where he was doing his show in where was he doing it? Um, uh, that would have been Banshee's Labyrinth. It was I think Again. it was Underbelly. Was it not Underbelly? I didn't see the Underbelly shows. If if he did ones in Underbelly, I wasn't there. It, but yeah. they had a consistent mm -hmm. run. It was a place the, on the Cowgate. I think it might have been uh, Opium or Sneaky Pete's. It was next to there. You know, um, it, he he was it was I think it might have been Underbelly. I forget. Um, but he did his show in there. I missed his other show that was, I think, at Banshee. Yeah, uh, it, that ran for a full five days. Yeah. They made a good bit of money off of it as well. Yeah. Great crowds. Yeah. Filled the place every night. But it's, it's Banshee. Mm -hmm. If you want a gig, that's the place yeah. to do it. And that's a great thing with your premiere that you kind of you build up good relationships with a lot of these people. I mean, uh, you were saying, I think that you were saying that the management's changed at the uh, Blind Poet recently. Management has changed. Yes, point, but yeah. I mean, it's 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 great because you can build these connections and these little networks of, of you know where you can you can play that card or you can play that tool that's in your toolbox. You go, I can use that place. Well, I was very lucky. Um, we booked Banshee's Labyrinth for the premiere, and we turned up to the premiere, and they had no recollection of the booking. Re oh, they looked, they looked the at the the books, and they said this hasn't been written down. And I was very lucky that they still let us use it you know I should have I should have charged those fuckers I mean everyone there was buying drinks yeah that was a good 60 people that weren't initially going to be there buying drinks I could I could have gotten some some commission yeah. off of those well, guys is that kind of place expensive to book something in there free is it, was it free it was okay. free I got that venue for free I was very lucky yes I mean I think I think, if, I think if it's not a peak time most places will say for free because as long as it's not weekends yes. I believe this was a what a Thursday might have been, yeah. Thursday night, I think. Um, because, yeah, I remember getting the bus up there. And it was, uh, it was, you know, I I think I assumed it would be a certain way when I went up there. I said, oh, it's going to be like a five-minute film. And, uh, oh, yeah, I think a lot of people were expecting that. Well, yeah, I didn't know much about it. I just knew it was your, your new film. And I thought, oh, that's that's great. You know, I'm going to go see that. And, and I think on the way up there, I envisioned, like, Okay, watching a film premiere in a bar, we just kind of like, they're going to turn the music off and going to watch it on the TV screen in the corner of the room where they usually have the rugby or whatever it is. And it'll be a short film. And I said, you know, um, I said, I'm getting the bus up there. I was like, you know, and I was pretty tired that day. 
so I was like oh you know I might give it a miss and which is not a reflection on you but no, I was like, you know it's, it's a quick thing you know I said if it's going up on YouTube as well I'm gonna watch it there and I got there I was like wait Banshee have a small theater screen and then we went in I was like oh right it's like a full on cinema in here and there was like more people coming in and more people and more people and, and you were just looking happier and happier I could clearly tell you were surprised that you, you like you said earlier you didn't expect that many people I to had up. no idea uh, and I'd seen Ross on, was on Facebook turn like, up. come along at Doug's premiere I was like okay right so I'll go with this and it was ended up full and I was like well this is like and I think you got up before the show before started before and after and you said yeah. it's, it's I think you told us oh it's about 40 minutes long yeah. I was like whoa and I was watching it and I uh, the whole way through I was like this is such a good film right because I, I was pleasantly surprised by the scale of it like we've been talking about and and I, for example uh you've mentioned already that you that are you the kind of person that has uh, pieces of paper with just ideas written on them you go i might no. do something with that or do you go situation i'm gonna make a film i'm done i'm gonna make another film how, how do you do it because adam boris is the kind of guy he's got a pile of just things that he hasn't made i've, just I've got so he, many ideas yeah, but they're all my jotted heads. down an idea I, yeah. I sh- i've got to start writing them down because i'll forget about them yeah. i've got i've i've got decent ideas i'm sure um and also when you start writing something down and you go when you come back to it you, you've kind of you've you've not got the taste for the moment when you came when you had the light bulb moment anymore uh, the inspiration it's almost like if you find it you got to pursue it right away in yeah. a strange kind well, of way well this is another one of the mistakes that these people make these film filmmakers they jump into these their baby so, so yeah. not, not yeah. any of them they jump into their baby right away and it's like right, yeah make some of your weaker ideas first so that you've got experience so that you don't rape your yeah. own baby like yeah. immediately instead of like one film with a great concept that's terribly carried off terribly and a bunch executed. of films that are fantastically carried off with rel- relatively boring unoriginal concepts you know yeah. <laughs> it's I found though that that film I can't think of anything else I've seen where it's a radio and he's talking to someone who's a murderer I mean I maybe Maybe I think uh, CSI or something. Maybe they've run with something similar. Play to that. Mi- Some people said it reminded me uh, them of Play Misty for me. I haven't seen that. I've not seen it either. Uh, and the Night Watcher, uh, the Night Listener. That was Robin Williams, right? His radio DJ. I've seen that. I didn't think it was very similar. Yeah, his other radio DJ film. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Instead of Good Morning, what is it? Good Morning Vietnam. Yeah. I yeah. mean, this one's a. Uh, he, he becomes friends with a boy that keeps calling in that it's dying of AIDS so he goes right. to meet the boy and it turns out that this boy doesn't seem to exist and that his mother is just faking it to get attention right. it was it's like it was an okay it was an show. okay film it was a, it was an okay yeah. film Robin Williams was very good that um again a comedian playing a radio DJ mm-hmm. much like Des O'Gorman's yeah. playing a radio DJ and and the guy that played um did you ever have a character name for the killer no you just called the killer the John the John Doe the, the John unnamed. Doe that guy he was very convincing you like point where, where I was watching him and I was like this guy's a mean guy you know what you actually get behind the villain you're like this no I, I'm sure that he's actually a mean guy in real life as well but he was fitting, sitting like one row down for me I was like oh that is a different man like he can play that part and look like a mean motherfucker oh, did you did you hear him in the end credits no when when the end credits was coming to the end he started speaking over the end credits in the voice of the character that he was playing really? and they, uh, oh, elicited wow. a laugh from yeah. the audience wow um, yeah. I've now thankfully I really like Gary very very lovely man uh, we've built up a working relationship yeah. from now on he's sent me a short film that someone's written mm. and he wants me to direct it yeah. and this the new film that mm. I'm writing um, nearly finished as well uh, Gary and we'll talk about that I was going to talk oh, about that please yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gary is playing a heavy mm. and a, a rough yeah. debt collector guy and he's got the perfect look uh-huh. for that yeah can I just say you, you actually derailed me from that I, that's the first time that's happened thus far <laughs> derailed you from what I, I was like, he was like and he was and he was a lovely guy but you know you, you've, you've written uh, ideas down but then no, I, mean, I actually derailed it I ah, derailed good. it you added to the derailment though I, I initially derailed it though because uh, I talked about uh, that guy who by the way gave a fantastic portrayal is what I was driving at and you, you, I was watching and going this this guy has to be a horrible guy in real life he's like no and he's actually a really nice guy uh, along with Des a great um, a great uh, there, was, there was a great audible chemistry between yeah. the two of them yeah and and and, and they didn't actually have uh, any screen time together no, they didn't and the opening shot where he's in his kitchen see open lines is coming back to me now ah. like the, the individual details of the film um, 
because I, ironically if you give anything long enough it all becomes blurred lines uh, no pun intended but you know there's the opening kitchen scene where he is he's angry and you can tell this is a kind of bit of a maniac and that that establishing kind of scene if you want to call it that uh, separate men did you know that no the the voice and the body are two completely separate people really yeah right okay so you're saying Gary was the guy that was voicing Gary it and the uh, Grant is a friend of the family's who's never acted a day in his life and he said that he'd help me out because he has that burly look right okay so Grant was the guy that was actually playing the killer Grant played the killer Gary provided the voice I see I see I didn't know that it was two separate guys yeah. okay right okay um, well that guy did a fantastic job yeah. physically in the never role act- and by the, the way if the phone, I yeah. showed yeah. you the outtakes Lewis I mean this guy's never acted before and he was breaking like ever- he's such a warm hearted lovely man with a completely infectious laugh and he was he was making the film in so much fun and he was being involved with all of it yeah. especially when we got Emma in he'd never acted before so doing this along he's got to kill this woman he's got to yeah. like that's dressed as a prostitute I mean mm. and initially Emma's part didn't exist then and because initially she started Emma's off just with the radio exist. yeah well uh, uh, Grant and Gary's part not didn't much. well maybe Gary's part would have existed over the phone but, but Grant's and part and Gary didn't wasn't exist, yeah planned in advance and mm. I didn't I didn't have a voice yeah I found that was one of the last things that I did was get yeah. Grant's I, I, uh, Gary's I, I, I've voice I've got a mental recordings. image of like Des O'Gorman having a conversation with like a serial killer Microsoft Sam like <laughs> generating me voice feeding them lines I am, while holding I am the camera. going to kill her you know like you can't stop me you know Des as well with very little preparation yeah. one of the screens that's on in the radio station that has the script and mm. Des is reading it off I mean this isn't these yeah. aren't lines that Des uh-huh. and he's remembered. making it look like he's picking the tracks yeah, yeah.